Hello and welcome to St. John's Lafayette Square. My name is Rob Fisher and I'm the rector of St. John's Church. I'm really happy to welcome you here virtually to our speaker series this morning. And we are delighted and honored to have as our guest, Professor Elaine Pagels, who is a professor at Princeton University, also a religious historian and a public thinker. And so thank you for joining us this morning. And I will now turn it over to Clark Irvin. Thank you so much, Rob. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so pleased to have back with us today, Professor Elaine Pagels. Some of you may remember that Professor Pagels was with us in person pre-COVID a few years back to talk about her groundbreaking work on the Gnostic Gospels. She is a professor of the history of religion at Princeton University. She's been there since 1982, shortly after uh, winning the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship. In addition to the Gnostic Gospels, she's the author of a number of other important books, including Beyond Belief, The Secret Gospel of Thomas, The Origin of Satan, Adam, Eve, and the Serpent, and Revelations, Visions, Prophecy, and Politics in the Book of Religion. Her most recent book is called Why Religion? And as you will hear, it is a sharp departure from the previous books in that as the subtitle, A Personal Story, suggests, it's a deeply personal account of her own journey of faith. And she has asked that we depart from our traditional format of lecture followed by Q&A and instead uh, have it as completely a conversation first between her and me and then between her and you. A number of you have sent questions beforehand and I'm sure others of you will be sending questions as we go along. Professor Pagels earned her bachelor's degree and master's degree from Stanford and her PhD from Harvard in addition to the MacArthur Fellowship, she's also the recipient of a number of other prestigious awards, including the Guggenheim Fellowship for Humanities, a Rockefeller Fellowship, and President Obama presented her with the National Medal for the Arts. So with that, please join me in welcoming back Professor Elaine Pagels. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I thank wish you. it were in person, but it's good that we can do this virtually. That's right. Well, thank you so much. Well, great. Well, why don't we start right at the beginning? The title of the book, as I said, is Why Religion? And you write in the book that it was seven years, if I read that correctly, in the making. So how did, where did the title come from and uh, what prompted it? The title is, is kind of a theme of my work. Um, I was brought up in a family in which my father had given up the kind of Presbyterian Christianity of his family for Darwin. And I was told that science was, had made religion obsolete. That was only for uneducated people who simply didn't know anything about science. Um, so, you know, in this kind of secular academic world that my father lived in where science was king, religion was non-existent and any kind of a spiritual dimension as well. So. It's only much later that I that I realized I was deeply engaged and fascinated with the traditions that we associate with religious traditions, particularly the Christian Christian traditions. But it's a question people often ask: Why religion? Why do you do that? And when I met my husband, he he asked. He was a theoretical physicist. He said, "Religion? I mean, why? Why don't you?" study something of importance in the real world. And I said, well, why do you study elementary particles? <laughs> you know, nobody can see them. <laughs> so, but of course, you know, these traditions have great impact in the world. Absolutely. That, you mentioned your parents and I was gonna ask specifically about that. You talked about their, or at least your father's approach to religion. Did your mother have a similar one? And could you talk in particular about your relationship with your parents and your relationship with her in particular because that figures into the discussion later? Well, they, they just, she followed, you know, him in a kind of traditional family. He was very much the head of the family and she rather adopted his views about religion. Her family was nominally Christian. Um, so we went to a rather boring Methodist church. I mean, they had nice, sort of, you're supposed to be nice to people. That was sort of what I got out of it, but that was about it. It didn't have much intensity or passion the way the original Methodist church did with the social gospel. That wasn't much present. So 
this was just not an important part of my life. I loved poetry, music, drama, dance. Now, those are all the, the arts that religious tradition has energized in every tradition, whether it's, you know, Navajo or whether it's Buddhist or whether it's Jewish or Christian or whatever. Uh, but I didn't know that then. In fact, you danced with Martha Graham, which is a fun fact that I didn't know until I read the book, right? Well, it would be nice to say that that way, Clark, but actually I just went to classes that her, her troupe taught. Um, they were elementary classes by their standards and they were phenomenal teachers. Mm -hmm. um, no. One of the early scenes in the book that, that really grabbed me because I had a similar experience is your exposure to Billy Graham. You're watching the Crusades uh, and the impact that they had on you and your thoughts about religion at the time. Could you describe that? Well, I didn't really know who Billy Graham was, but I was living in Palo Alto, which was very boring. And friends of mine said they were going to San Francisco for something. So I just jumped at the chance. I was 14 and anything going on in San Francisco was more interesting. What I didn't know is that Billy Graham was an evangelical preacher and that the entire uh, sports stadium, you know, where you could see baseball played was packed with thousands and thousands of people to hear this young evangelist then. And I was 14 and he was a stunning preacher and the choir, the music, the power of what he said was, was something that took me by surprise. And it opened up a spiritual dimension. And when it came to the altar call, I just loved it. I just jumped right in. And I mean, I was 14. So the idea that you could be born again and start over in a new family and you know, belong to the family of God, I loved it. It was a powerful experience. My parents though were horrified. So your life was shaped by three horrific tragedies. And as I read about them, I thought of Job. And in fact, later in the book, you talk about Job, but I hope we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit. But the question, you know, is prompted by reading about those tragedies. How does one person bear so much grief? So I want to talk about each of those tragedies. And uh, those tragedies were the death of your then boyfriend during the college years, Paul, the, the death of your precious son, Mark, at the tender age of six, and then shortly thereafter, about a year thereafter, the tragic death of your beloved husband, Heinz. So I want to talk about each. Let's start with Paul. Tell me a little bit about Paul and a little bit about the circumstances of his death and, and what you learned from that. Well, actually, I would say my life has not just been shaped by those things, but many others. But those were certainly very powerful moments. Um, this is a high school friend, um, very talented artist who had quit high school and um, to paint. And he knew so much about painting and he was doing remarkable things at the age of 16. We had a group of Maverick friends who were making music and um, all kinds of havoc. Um, when I was in high school, it was very interesting. Um, and, but, but I was in this evangelical group for about a year after going to the Billy Graham crusade. However, Paul was killed in an automobile accident after a party in which he was with other friends of ours, one of whom was Jerry Garcia from the Grateful Dead, who was a friend. And, uh, and I went back to the evangelical church and, and said, you know, my friend has been killed in this accident. They said, that's terrible. I mean, um, was he born again? And I said, no, he was Jewish. And they said, well, then he's in hell. And I felt like I'd been smacked and you know, just, just hit down. I, I was stunned. And I just walked out of there stunned by myself and never went back because I thought what they're saying has nothing to do with the love of God, which is what I thought this was about. Right. So I, I just had to leave. And in the book, you say, instead of drawing people together as Billy Graham had when he spoke of God's love for everyone, these people were like a club for people spiritually superior to everyone who didn't share their beliefs. Well, too often that happens in every tradition. 
as you know, or at least in the traditions, the monotheistic traditions, Judaism, Islam, Christianity. And, and I, had to, I had to abandon that for a number of years. And it was much later that I thought, wait a minute, something powerful happened at that moment, something that hit me very deeply, some opening to a spiritual dimension of life, you know, even if not the entire evangelical community works that way. He opened something in that preaching and that event. So I wanted to find out whether it was Christianity or, or religion or what. So I went off to graduate school to, um, to find out what do we know about Jesus anyway. And that's when I discovered these texts called the Gnostic Gospels. It wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for what we knew about Jesus. And it's hard to find that because we only have sources that are written maybe 40 years after his death. But these texts show that there's much more to the Christian tradition than what Orthodox Christianity had transmitted. Right. And you say that in particular, the, quest, the questions that Paul's death prompted for you were, where do the dead go? And how do they, and how to go on living alert to death's presence and its inevitability? Yes. I mean, you know, it's, it's shocking that someone that young can suddenly be gone like that. So, so that, of course, raised a very painful kind of question. And later, the very personal this, I mean, our son, that was hard to bear. He was a marvelous child, and, but born with some kind of um, pulmonary defect that uh, he died when he was six. And my husband's death, as you know, was, was a mountain climbing accident. And so completely unexpected after we had just adopted two babies in the wake of our son's death. Right. And let's talk about Mark now, your, your son. So there were a number of what I would call in the book intimations of the divine and at least one intimation of the demonic. And to talk about the divine to start with, at one point, I'm not quite sure when this was in relation to Mark's death, but I think it, you were putting him to bed and he said to you, I love you all my life and all my death. And that suggests that even at that tender age, he knew he was going to die. And he wanted you to know that even in death, he would go on loving you. And he hoped that you would find some comfort in that. Could you talk to us about that moment? That happened two days before he died and his death was unexpected. It was pulmonary hypertension, which is a condition in which either children or people in their 20s typically will suddenly die of a heart, heart, or heart attack because it's, a, it's an unseen illness. It's, it's not too symptomatic until it happens. But it was stunning. And my husband said, I, I just, I was so shocked when he said that, that I walked out and I said, you'll never believe what Mark said. He said, he can't have said that. And I said, I could not have made it up. I don't know what happens, you know, but there were, there was a sense of a spiritual dimension about all of this and an awareness in that child even, and our experience of him, that, that was quite extraordinary. Yes, and there's another anecdote that's like that. You said that he, as you said earlier, was a very, very spirited and lively boy, and he liked to play a game that he called King of the Dragons. Yes. And he said at one point, I am the King of the Dragons, and the Queen of the Dragons is Sarah. And you ask him, you know, who's, who's Sarah? How does that name come to you? Do you have friends, somebody you know named Sarah? And he said, no. And then later you adopted uh, a daughter. And when you went to the adoption agency, you asked them what they were calling her. And they said, Sarah. And later in later years, she would wonder because she knew she was adopted, whether she really belonged to your family. And you were able to tell her that she did belong because her late brother knew that she was coming by having mentioned that years ago, right? Yes, and that's how, that's how stories and narratives and, and weaving together perceptions and hints and dreams and who knows where they come from creates meaning. 
um, in events so that I could give her the assurance, just as you said, Clark, that she did belong. She was part of it um, because he had known and welcomed her. In fact, he had um, come in with her when, when, when this baby was first brought to us. So it was, it was, um, it felt very connected and still does. I mentioned intimations of the demonic. There's by my count, one instance of that, and it was so arresting. I'd like to talk about it for a minute and actually read from the book. This was when Mark was, uh, was dying and he was just about to go into a surgery. If I have that right. And you say, I was startled by something else that may have been a dream, although it, I didn't seem to be asleep. In that dream, or whatever it was, a menacing being, male but inhuman, approached me, smelling like danger, wordlessly threatening death, Mark's death. Terrified, I fought an impulse to turn and run, feeling that if I did, everything would be lost. Then I recall something our dance teacher often had said, put weight in your feet and stand. When I did, the dark figure retreated, but then he came forward toward us a second time, even more frightening. Again, I longed to run, but resisted and managed to stand against him. Once again, he retreated only re to return a third time, more terrifying than ever. Feeling that I could not possibly stand a moment longer, I spoke a name, Jesus Christ. And at that, the dangerous being fled and my fear dissolved. Could you talk about that experience? Well, that was very strange. Actually, it was years before he died. He was, he was then going into open heart surgery at the age of one. And, and of course, I was worried about his survival. Um, but that, that was like a trance or something. And later, I asked a colleague of mine, I was in teaching at Columbia, a colleague um, who studied Islam and uh, is a Lebanese Christian. I said, you wrote a book about Iblis, about Satan in, in Muslim tradition. I had this weird experience. And he said, well, that's how the stories about the Satan always appear. They, he, three times, he said, this is typical story, story stuff in stories about Satan. And I thought it's interesting that people have experiences like this. And that's why, although it wasn't that I thought it was Satan, there was an experience that I had that made me aware that when people talk about spiritual experiences and the presence of other beings, spirit beings, they're talking about something that actually happens. It's not just a fantasy. It's some kind of experience. Now, whether it's psychological projection or whether it's some presence impinging on ours, our consciousness, I don't know. So I just call them experiences I can't explain. And I thought, you know, I'm a professor of religion. And if I put this in the book, people are going to think she's really off the deep end, you know? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and it, it's not something scholars do. Right. Speaking about experiences I can't explain. But I know now that people have them. Many people have them. Uh, many people have intimations of, uh, of, of, the, the loss of someone they love, of, of the death of someone who can be far away. Many people have stories they think of as miraculous. I don't know how they happen. I can't explain them. But I do know that they happen. And it makes me aware that I think Christians place far too much emphasis on belief because Christianity was turned into a set of beliefs in the fourth century at the Nicene Council. Mm -hmm. But really, it's what the early Christians called a way. It's a way of life. And it is about experiencing a spiritual dimension of life, which is what William James wrote about in his wonderful book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. So that's where uh, I felt I was speaking to those kinds of awarenesses. Fascinating. Now, let's talk about your beloved Heinz. You said that he was a theoretical physicist. Yes. And he died, as you mentioned, in an accident about a year or so after Mark's death. Let's start at the beginning, though. You mentioned uh, on your wedding day, you got the feeling that Paul was present. Could you talk a little bit about that? Actually, it was only when we went to Palo Alto um, after that. Just the presence of somebody who, who had died seemed to be in the room with me. 
I didn't dare say this to my new husband at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt that I had to acknowledge this presence. And I just decided to welcome it. And then it changed. I don't know what to make of these things, as I said, but it does seem to me we're living in a universe where there are many things that are mysterious. And it's not that they're against science or nature, it's just a, aspects of our nature that we don't yet have ways to understand. Could you talk a little bit about the circumstances of, of Heinz's death? Well, he, he was a theoretical physicist, loved nature, and like all the physicists I know, was always outdoors, loving to be in the mountains and the wilderness. That's where they always meet. That's where they met every summer in the Colorado um, mountains. And they do that because these are people who just grow up loving to be outdoors. So it was um, one of the two hikes he took every week, every summer. For 22 years, we were married. And he, he just lost his footing. It could well have been um, a kind of post-polio syndrome. He'd had polio as a five-year-old child. And sometimes that creeps up on people and immobilizes nerves in the, in, in the feet. That's what his mother thought. That's what I think is probably what happened. But it was very shocking. And it could have destroyed us. It could have destroyed me. I knew that. And speaking of mothers, your mother did not come to Mark's funeral, I think you said, nor to Heinz's, right? Well, in the family that I grew up in, partly because they had abandoned any religious tradition, there were no ways to deal with the, the transitions in life. I mean, I think I was baptized and I was married in a church, um, though Heinz wasn't much of a believer. It was a, it was a wonderful event. So baptism and marriage and adolescence and death are all transition moments when religious traditions have celebrations and rituals that help people make those transitions, right? Um, my family didn't do that. They simply sort of pretended those things didn't happen. Death didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a very sort of middle class kind of thing. It was just a kind of awkward silence. So I didn't have ways of coping with it and having to deal with it. So, so my mother didn't come. She said she couldn't leave my father at that point. Mm -hmm. um, there were other excuses for just avoiding acknowledgement even of what had happened, mm -hmm. but I had to deal with it. And so the traditions that I study became a kind of yoga that I could explore. Because if you look at the Hebrew Bible, if you look at the, the New Testament, it speaks about, it articulates, it works with the things that happen to people. And also the most difficult things from the Garden of Eden on. Mm -hmm. It's about how to cope with suffering and death um, in a world which otherwise has beauty and life and glory, there are these moments of, of uh, terrible suffering that people endure. How do we do it? So part of what I wrote, I didn't want to write a grief memoir part because everybody knows about grief. We all do. I wanted to write about the surprise <laughs> that I could have joy and have a life even after those things happened and do. <laughs> Right. And that's, to me, very surprising and kind of wonderful that, that there are ways that, that human beings have learned to, to get through these things. And these traditions which we share culturally, Christian tradition being one of them, and the one most closest to me, uh, offers ways of, of working with that. Thanks be to God. Let's talk about intimations of the divine in connection with Heinz's death. So could you explain what you write about his comment, your, your, uh, your, your, your thought that he said, it's fine with me and what that means in this context? Well, many people, as you know, have experiences in which, in which they have a sense that the person who died is there. 
I didn't have any expectation of that. Um, but I was actually up at, at a Trappist monastery, a Roman Catholic monastery, way up in the mountains of Colorado, where through a Jewish friend who's a musician, I got, I'd gotten to know the monks. And, <laughs> and these monks were very, were monks who conversed with Buddhists all the time. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a um, Cistercian monastery um, where the monks live in silence and contemplative prayer. And they were so helpful and receptive. And I went there a year after, uh, no, it was only three days after Heinz died. I was up at the monastery sitting with one of the monks who was an, a man of great spiritual depth. And, and after we meditated for about an hour, I suddenly, it occurred to me that I could ask Heinz a question. So I said, well, how do you feel about this? I mean, I didn't expect an answer, but it was instantly as though he spoke and said, it's, this is fine with me. It's you I'm concerned about now. And I was so shocked because I thought, wait a minute, I would have said that's coming out of my unconscious, right? Maybe it did, but I would not have said that. It wasn't fine with me at all. It was devastating. It, it, it was excruciating. And I was so shocked that he said it that I was angry. I thought he said, what do you mean fine with you? How can you say that? We have two little babies and suddenly you're gone. But, but it did seem like something he would say actually, <laughs> because he was quite a remarkable person. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what to make of these, but, and I thought I shouldn't include these things in the book because they sound a little weird to some people, especially coming from a scholar, but that's, all part of the grist for the mill, the sense that these traditions are not talking about ideas in your head. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? It's not just that. That's a different matter. And to me, a lot less um, provocative and powerful than the experiences we have that change our lives. I'm so glad you wrote about these experiences in your book precisely because you are a scholar and because one wouldn't have expected uh, you to speak of them or even to have these experiences, frankly. One more I'd like to talk about and then I wanna ask what for me is the big question posed by your book and that is, but, but first another intimation of the, can you talk about the watch stopping, Heinz's watch and? Well, that was another strange one. Um, one of the things that, that the um, mountain rescue gave me after his death was his Timex watch, which had the date and time on it. And he died on the 23rd of July. And I put it in the top drawer of my bureau and in New York and, and was looking, rummaging around there six months later, around the time of his birthday, he would have been 50, he died at 49. Um, and I suddenly saw that the time on the Timex watch was the day of his 50th birthday. This is six months after he died. I mean, I don't know what to make of that. Amazing. But, but there's, it, it just, you know, reminds me of Shakespeare saying, there are more things on heaven and earth than, than are dreamed of in your philosophy uh, or in your science, because science is magnificent, but it addresses certain sets of questions, as my husband well knew. It doesn't address questions of ultimate meaning or of questions about transcendence. Right. It doesn't try to. Let's talk about a major theme in the book, and that is the issue of guilt. You know, the question is, if God is, as we have all been taught in the Christian tradition, uh, all-powerful, and if he is all loving, how is it that these kinds of things happen? And you go on after posing that question to talk about guilt. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Well, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. And I certainly don't think God sits around planning events like this. Uh, that's, that's not a view of, that I share. But, but I do know that I felt when our son had this very rare condition of pulmonary hypertension, uh, which is a invariably fatal disease, the doctors told us when he was one. Um, 
you know, I felt I had done something wrong. What, what had I done? What had we done? What, how could this happen? And I felt somehow guilty and, and ashamed um, of, of being the person who had given birth to a child with that kind of fatal, defective, you know, pulmonary system. And later I began to realize that it's not an accident that people feel when something happens, they say, why did this happen to him? How could this happen to me? Why does this happen to you? Uh, why did that person get this terrible diagnosis? And, and they, we say it as though it's someone's fault. But part of the reason we do, it's not an accident because our culture has taught us that. The Garden of Eden story says, we would not die had someone not sinned. Sin is, uh, is what creates death as a punishment. Adam and Eve sinned because they uh, died because they sinned. And furthermore, I was reading the story of David, King David mm -hmm. and Bathsheba. Bathsheba being the, the woman he, he uh, desired and then had her husband killed in battle so that he could claim her as one of his wives. But before they married, um, they had an infant son. And the story uh, in the Bible says, and the Lord smote the son of David and Bathsheba because of their sin, because of the sexual sin that they were together before they were married. And I thought, wow. So this is saying when a child dies, and you remember that in the ancient world, 50% of children or 40 would die in infancy mm -hmm. or childhood. Mm -hmm. Very high mortality rate in almost every culture. So when that happens in almost every family, the family is told it's your fault, you did something wrong. And so this is our culture. It's not like you might say in a Buddhist culture, well, life and death are part of a cycle. They happen to everyone. They are not your fault. They are just the way the universe works. But our culture teaches us that there is blame, there is fault, and it's probably your fault. And so that adds a great deal of pain and agony, especially when the person who dies is a child. Uh, mm -hmm. The family feels implicated in some kind of blame. And that adds a great deal of suffering. So I wanted to write about that for other parents because as you may know, and many of us know, the, the death of a child is something that many people never talk about. And I wanted to say, wait a minute, if this happens to you or people you know, try to let go of the guilt and the shame because so, those are unnecessary sufferings when you're already suffering a great deal. I'm so glad you did. And that, that notion is so deeply ingrained, as you said, in our culture that I recall from the book that your daughter, Sarah, said after her father's death, make daddy come home, I'll be good. Even she thought that she was partly responsible for his death. Children do feel that when a parent dies, you know? Uh, they think that the parent has left because they did something bad. I mean, that's just a reflex. So yes, I was, I was saddened that she had that perception. Um, but uh, as I say, one reason for studying the history of Christianity is to see the powerful and positive influences it has on our culture. It also has negative influences and has been used in many ways to have negative influences, as we all know, like saying that, that a Jewish boy who dies in an accident is going to hell. Well, Jesus was a Jewish boy who died um, by violence. I mean, that kind of, that kind of, um, there's a, we, we, so I study these traditions both to find what they contribute to our lives and what, and what uh, ways in which they can have negative influences and to say, we need to let go of some of those because they're, they become so unconsciously part of our perception. We don't even know they're there often. Mm -hmm. Well, now to turn some, to some questions from the audience. One question is, and this is a particularly good one, I think, for you, since Heinz was a theoretical physicist. 
how has nature inspired human beings quest for a higher power? And I might amend that to say, how, if at all, has nature inspired your quest for a higher power, your understanding of a higher power? Well, that's a very interesting question because in, in our Western traditions, even the, the, the story in Genesis separates humans from animals and the rest of nature. But what I found in some of the secret gospels is a different view. I mean, I grew up in a world loving the outdoors, feeling that the awareness of the aliveness of the natural world is deeply part of us too, uh, which inspires the religious traditions of Native Americans, of people in all parts of the world, right? All parts of the world have recognized spirits in, in the natural world. And so when I was reading the Gospel of Thomas for the first time, I realized there were parts of the Christian movement that also embraced the intimate connection between what we call nature and what we often separate as supernatural. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, I am the light that is before all things. I am, I am what brought all things into being. All things come forth from me. They all return to me. Split a piece of wood and I am there. Lift up the rock and you will find me. So this speaks of Jesus speaking as a, of, as a voice from the divine energy that brings the world into being and rocks, stones, stars, hippopotamuses, people, all of it <laughs> um, as part of the divine energy. It may come from Jewish mystical tradition which does speak of the world that way. We were talking beforehand about uh, the church in Princeton that you, you go to. Do you consider yourself to be an Episcopalian now? And if so, uh, how did you come to the Episcopal Church? I came to this church, again, it was kind of an accident. I was, I was actually jogging around Central Park in a cold day after my son's diagnosis. He was then two years old. And I, I decided to go into the Church of the Heavenly Rest, which is right there, to get warm from this run, and started hearing the choir sing. And it was so moving and powerful. And the church was beautiful. And I felt a kind of peace in it. And I thought, you know, I could actually go there on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and met the rector. And he, he was a wonderful person, is a wonderful person and understood very well what I was dealing with. And I became a member of that church. I love this church. Yes, I'm an Episcopalian. I don't feel that defines entirely my understanding of, of the history of religion because it's much broader than that. But it's my entry into it is through the traditions with which I grew up and which are most familiar. And I, I, I love these, I mean, they, the worship service opens with music and prayer and liturgy, and it's designed to open us up, to make us available for the presence of the divine. Final question. Um, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. The distinction between being a professor of religion, history of religion in your case, and a theologian. A, a lot of people, I think, confuse the two. Could you talk a little about the distinction and the importance of the distinction? Yes, it's important to me. Um, theologians talk about God. That's what theologos means, literally. And historians, I think we talk about people. We talk about the customs, the traditions that people come up with, the way they create rituals, the way they create songs and hymns and prayer, um, not so much about God, but many people, so, so I'm not trying to preach to my students, but to invite them to think about these traditions, how they have been shaped by them or not. What is it about these traditions they might resonate with and find depth and spiritual energy and what in them they might discard because they find them, those traditions, useless or 
mistaken. Um, just, you know, it's, and also recognize that what I'm thinking of as a spiritual dimension isn't limited to religious traditions and whether people go to church or any of the markers of church attendance that sociologists write about. It's deeper than that. I think many people who reject the churches that we like and love do so because they, they're looking for something they haven't found there. Uh, they're also on a spiritual quest. Thank you so much, Elaine. It has been such a joy and pleasure to talk to you today uh, about this remarkable book, Why Religion? A Personal Story. It's right here. I commend it to everyone for, for your reading. In fact, I should have mentioned, Elaine, that our reading group here at St. John's has read uh, Why Religion, and I'm sure many of those who belong to this group um, have done, uh, did so, and I'm sure many of them uh, have joined the call, and I hope others of you likewise will read this remarkable book. Thank you so much for being with us. Next Sunday, our speaker will be Jim Tankersley from uh, the New York Times, who will be talking about his book on the American middle class. Thanks again to Elaine Pagels, and thanks to all of you for joining us this Sunday morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Good talking with you. You too. All the best.